said unto me, let us go down to the house of the Lord. Mm. How many of us are glad to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. 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 I'm going to raise both of my hands. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Glad to be here with you today. In the last week, as I was as I was in the act of preaching the message about standing in the old ways, I had so many different things that was running through my mind. And I thought to myself, Lord, i got to stay focused on this message or I'll be here at midnight tonight preaching this stuff. But all throughout the course of the week, uh, I've just had a pulling on my heart to go back and review some of the old fundamental things like we learned back in vacation Bible school and Sunday school class. Some of the old, old messages that you don't hardly hear preached anymore. You know, David and Goliath. Mm -hmm. Daniel and the lion's den. Yeah. The three Hebrews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, being thrown into a fiery furnace and not being burned up. I mean, they came, Brother Chuck, to look in and check on them to see if they were burned up yet or not. They saw them in there dancing around. They knew they threw three in. But they looked and they held and they saw a fourth. And the fourth one looked like unto the Son of Man. I just, and I began thinking how much I love those old fundamental Bible stories. It says, Zacchaeus sitting up in a tree. Jesus saying, come down, for today I'm going to abide in your house. And I remember thinking, what a revival would take place in our church world today if we just preached the word like we were called to do. You know, yeah. Paul charged Timothy to preach the word mm -hmm. in season, out of season, <laughs> reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. But some of those things we've forgotten about. Yeah. It wasn't too long ago, some of our grandchildren came over to spend the night with us, and when they came, they brought some of their little friends with them. Now, you can rest assured our grandchildren know about all of those people that we just mentioned to you in the Scripture. And we found a window of opportunity to start talking about these things to these kids. And our grandchildren knew what we were talking about, but you can see the other ones kind of scratching their head. They'd never heard about it before. Mm -hmm. And so I took the time to tell them. Amen. It made me wonder, how, how many more people are in our world today, not just little children, but grown adults, mm -hmm. that if you began talking to them about Daniel and the lion's den, they would look at you with a blank face. Yeah. Or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who stood for God when nobody else would stand even if it meant they had to stand alone, they stood in their faith, for their faith in God. Yeah, they suffered some consequences for it, but really there was no suffering because when they were pulled out of that fire, their clothes weren't singed. They didn't even smell of smoke. Yeah. Makes me wonder how many people in our world today do not know those true fundamental stories. They're not really stories. They're truths about God and who He is and what He can do in our lives. So I've been praying about this all week long. I've been reading about this all week long and my heart and my mind has fallen in a place in the Scripture and another place that we are going to have to go way back to our own days of vacation Bible school and Sunday school class. I want you to open your Bibles today, if you will, Old Testament, to the book of Jonah. How many of you are familiar with the story of Jonah? Jonah and the whale. Jonah and the great fish. I don't know if I'll preach today, if I'll teach today. I feel kind of a comfortable spirit upon me. But there's some real biblical truths. And this is one of those classic messages of Jonah and the whale. It's a message of God's call upon our lives. How many of you know today you've got a call of God upon your life? Yeah. Every one of us that are well, I'm not a preacher. I'm, I'm not one of the trustees. I don't sing. I, 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 I'm not a 
teacher. You guys are the ones that's got to call God on your life. I'm just here. No, that's not true. Every one of you have a call of God upon your life. If you're in Christ Jesus, and Christ Jesus is in you, you're only saved because God has called upon you. You have a testimony, and your testimony is powerful, and your testimony is true. And people can argue the Bible with you until they're blue in the face, but I've learned nobody can argue your personal testimony of what God has done in your life. You have a call of God to be loving. You have a call of God to be forgiving. You have a call of God to operate and live matter of faith. If you're a husband, you have a call of God upon your life to be a good one. If you're a mother or a wife, you have a call upon your life to be a good one. Whatever God has created you to do, you have that call of God upon your life, which therefore means you have the ability to do it. But so oftentimes we think, I, I, I can't do more likely it is that we don't want to do that, which leads us to another part of this classic message, our disobedience to God. How many of you know that when we operate in a, in a way of disobedience to God, that we are going to suffer the consequences for that? The scripture teaches us that if any man knows to do good and does it not, to him it's sin. I wonder what is God calling you to today? What are you reluctant to obey the voice of God in your life over? See, this goes, this stretches far beyond the realm of preaching the message. There's some true application to that. Which leads me to the next point of this classic message that we're going to look at in the scripture today. That when we practice disobedience, and I know this isn't a popular message in our world today. But God didn't necessarily call me to be popular. He called me to stand upon the truth. And the truth is, yes, there's always grace. Yes, there's always mercy. Yes, there's always forgiveness. And I raise my hand in the air for all three of those. But there's another classic story in the scripture about a man named Samson who teaches us that when we practice disobedience to God, there will always be a consequence to pay. That consequence is the picture of the judgment of God. Yeah. This world today doesn't want us to preach about God's judgment. Yeah. This world today doesn't want us to preach that there is consequences for our actions. Our world today wants us to embrace this new wave of thinking that everyone has their own truth and your truth is your truth, and your truth is your truth, and my truth is my truth, and as long as I stay faithful to my truth, I'm walking in the truth. If that ain't a bunch of nonsense, I don't know what is. There can only ever be one truth. And if I'm walking in it, praise the Lord. If I'm not walking in it, I need to fall upon my face before the Lord in repentance, because the truth will always be the truth. Rather, rather I'm in it or rather I'm out of it doesn't change the fact that it's still the truth. And the truth is, yes, there's grace, yes, there's mercy, yes, there's forgiveness, which is also a judgment. One day, each and every one of us will stand before an almighty God and take account of the lives that we've lived here on this earth. And it's my prayer that every person that I should ever meet in this time that I have upon this earth, that they will humble themselves under God's mighty hand on this side of the grave. And take care of what they need to take care of here. Because once you get there, it will be too late to pray. Read with me, if you will. I'm in the book of Jonah. Say amen if you're there. I also need to know if there's anyone uh, anyone here would have uh, would volunteer to read just two verses of Scripture for me. Thank you, Chuck. I need you to put a bookmark in 1 Kings chapter 8. When I call upon you, I want you to read verses 37 and 38. 1 Kings 8, 37 and 38, for Brother Chuck. You can mark it in your scripture if you'd like so that you can follow along with him. 1 Kings chapter 8, 
chapter 8. I'm going to have to read verses 37 and 38, but not right now. So we're just going to call it.
But I believe part of our problem in our lives today is that we need to get our butts out of the way and just let God be God. But Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. How many of you know? Here's part of this classic message that I've heard preached over and over again. You can run and hide, but you cannot run and hide from God. God knows exactly where you're at. He knows exactly what you're doing. And it doesn't change the fact that he has a word for you. And a purpose for you. And a plan for you. And a call for you. Jonah ran, but you can't outrun God. He went down to Joppa. He found a ship going to Tarshish. Oh. So, I'm going to read this slow because I want you to hear this. So, he paid. The fair thereof. Another part of this classic message. When we choose to disobey God, we will always pay the fair thereof. We will always pay the fair thereof. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. The mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise and call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. You know, here's another part of that message. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to pay really close attention to the what I'm going to call the classic message up front. And when I'm done reading through the scripture and teaching you the classic message of the story of Jonah and the whale, I want to put some life application to it for you. But in this last verse of scripture that we just read, this, this verse number six, this speaks to something that we used to preach, but we don't preach anymore. We used to teach to our churches and to our families and to our children. We've stopped teaching it. There's a misconception in our world today. It says, if I'm hurting anybody, I'm only hurting myself. You mind your own business. <coughs> I'm not bothering you. Why are you so worried about me? My actions have nothing to do with your morals. Leave me alone and go live your life and let me live my life. Because if I'm hurting anybody, I'm only hurting myself. That's not true. Every action that we take has an effect upon somebody else. Every word that we speak, every action that we take, everything that we do touches somebody else. How are you touching people today? Do you wake up in the morning with the thought that I need to stand in righteousness because someone needs to see the righteousness of God? Do you wake up every morning with the thought that, Lord, I need to stand fast in your grace today. Let me carry myself in your grace. Let your forgiveness just ooze from me. Let your love just show forth today. Wherever I go, whomever I encounter, whatever I do, whatever I speak, whatever I touch, God, let me be aware that every word that I speak, every action that I take, everything that I do is going to have an effect upon someone else. Yeah. It is not true that your choices only affect you. Your choices affect so many people. Yeah. So many people. I can tell you how many times I've had to do family counseling. Moms and dads and brothers and sisters. Because of the action of one person in the family. It's totally destroyed everything. Can I tell you how many times I've been called in the middle of the night by a grieving mother or a grieving father who says, I need you to come to the hospital. My son has... You fell in the blank. I show up at the hospital and I see a teenage boy or girl or, or a 20-something or sometimes even a 30 or 40-year-old that's still somebody's little boy or somebody. 
somebody's little girl. And I see a grieving set of parents, a gray-haired old man, a withered-up woman, who said, I don't know where I went wrong, preacher. I taught him the right way. I showed her Jesus Christ in my life. And here they are fighting for their life. Their home is tore up, and their marriage is ended, and their kids are up. I don't know what I'm doing. What did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? Sometimes I have to look at them and say, listen, it's not you. I know you love your child. I know you love your son. I know you love your daughter, but she or he made a bad choice. And that bad choice is affecting all of you. And you need to just operate in a spirit of love and forgiveness. It's a hard thing to do, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's hard for us. It's hard for Job. It's hard for everybody. But verse number six. Verse number six tells us our choices that we make will have an effect on other people. Verse seven, and they said, everyone to his fellow, come and let us cast lots that we might know for whose cause this evil is come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation? Hmm. What were you called upon to do? What's your plan? What's your purpose? And whence comest thou? Where'd you come from? What country are you from? And of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am an Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee that the sea may be common to us? For the sea wrought, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be common to you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let, not, let us not perish for this man's let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us the innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah, they cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceeding, and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord, and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. It amazes me every time that I read verse 17 that my mind goes into the New Testament scripture where the people were seeking Jesus and asking Jesus for a sign. When might these things be? And Jesus went back to the old prophet Jonah as a picture of when a sign of the coming of Christ would be. He said, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a whale, so shall the Son of Man also be three days in the heart of the earth. What we see here is a picture, a shadow, an Old Testament image of the grace of God, which is Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, that's a hard one to swallow sometimes because we've been conditioned to think that this great whale was the judgment of God that came upon Jonah because of Jonah's disobedience. But we've missed something along the way. This whale is not the judgment of God upon Jonah. That storm was the judgment of God upon Jonah. Hmm. <laughs> And I'm going to get ahead of myself and preach the, one of the main points of the message right now, and I probably will come back to it. But this whale, this great fish, was not the judgment of God upon Jonah. That might challenge you. If it challenges you, okay. 
But I have to preach to you and teach to you the truth of the scripture the way the Holy Spirit has given it to me or I'm not doing you any good. So I'm going to ask you, if you will, to repeat something with me. This is very important in today's message. If you will, repeat with me, this great fish is not the judgment of God upon Jonah. Hopefully the Holy Spirit will allow me to show you that this great fish is not the judgment of God upon Jonah, but the storm was the judgment of God upon Jonah. This fish is a picture of the grace of God that delivers us from the judgment for the disobedience that we oftentimes walk in and brings us to the salvation of the Lord. This great fish is a picture of the grace of God. This great fish is a picture of the plan of God's salvation unto all men. This great fish <laughs> is a shadow of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. And I know that's challenging. Because how hard did Jonah want to get out of that whale? How hard did he pray? How hard did he seek the face of God? The Bible says, we're going to see it here in just a few more verses, from the belly of hell, Jonah said, I cried out unto my Lord, and he heard my prayer. You see, we've been conditioned to think that this whale was the judgment of God upon Jonah, but I'm praising God for every whale that has ever come into my life and swallowed me whole and protected me from the storm of judgment that should have came upon my life. You should be praising God from every whale that has swallowed you up and carried you to safety. Mm. Chapter 2, then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly. And said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. <laughs> if that doesn't leave you shouting, amen, I don't know what will. Out of my affliction, Job said, or Jonah said, I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me. Oh, in the midst, brother Chuck, of our affliction, we can cry out to God and know that he will hear us. Yeah. Brother Mark said something so profound. You see, as I was sitting on the front pew today, and I was writing down your prayer requests, and listening to your praises and testimonies, I was struggling. So I was like another classic old message that maybe the Lord will allow me to preach for a moment I felt like Jacob that was wrestling with the angel of the Lord. And I was saying in my heart and my mind as I'm writing these things down, God, here in just a couple of seconds, Brother Mark is going to say, let us now leave this world and step into his world and go to him in prayer. And before he says amen, he's going to say, Holy Spirit, will you rest upon preacher that and give him the scripture and the power to preach this message. In Jesus' name, amen. And Lord, here in three minutes and two seconds, I'm going to have to stand in the pulpit, and I'm going to have to open my Bible, and I'm going to have to open my mouth, and I'm going to have to preach to these people, and I still don't know if you want me in Luke chapter 2, if you want me in the book of Jonah, please reveal it unto me. And he said something, and well, I'm not giving you the credit on this one. I know it came from the Lord. And I wrote it down so that I could remind you what he said. That one of the names of God brings us, and I'm quoting, a place we can go and be safe. Mm -hmm. How many of you would ever dare to think inside the belly of a whale mm -hmm. is a safe place you can go 
them doggone whales that splash you and laugh at you and jump up in the air and hit balls with your noses, those are some huge fish. And I can't possibly think that inside the belly of that thing would be a safe place for me at all, bar none. I know I could never outswim that crazy thing, but I believe if I was ever out in the wild, in the ocean, swimming, and I happened to see a pot of those things, I'm going to do my best to outswim them. I don't, I don't mind sitting in the bleachers and watching one, but I don't want to be down in the water with one of them. Because it ain't safe. One time we took a trip to Florida. We were at Daytona. It was in the springtime. And I was out in the water, and I was having myself a blast. I just keep getting out a little bit further and a little bit further and a little bit further. Every time I go, I get out a little bit further because these waves, these waves were big that day, huge waves. And you can just kind of tread water, and when the wave would come up, you just, I don't know how it works, but I was able to figure out how to just, without a board or anything, just lay up on top of the wave and, whoa, get taken all the way in. I was having to be a blast. I thought if it was this fun from this deep, it's got to be really fun from this deep, so I went out this deep. And I don't know if you've ever been in the ocean, but to get into the ocean in water up to this deep, you've got to get pretty far out. Yeah. I finally got far enough out where I couldn't touch. So I was a long way. So I'm treading water. I'm waiting on my wave. I'm looking out the corner of my eye, waiting on a wave. And the next thing I see about 30 yards away from me, a fin comes up out of the water and I'm like, ah, ooh, I didn't wait on the wave. I was swimming for everything I had. I was screaming all the way in, get out of the water, get out of the water, there's a shark in the water. When I finally got to where my feet could touch, oh, I was, I was like Peter, man. I was walking out of the water. I was getting out of there. And when I got up to the bank, I had hundreds of people laughing. I thought, this isn't funny. Get your kids out of the water. Is it sharp? And there was some gray-haired old man sitting in the chair who had skin like leather. And you can just tell he had lived in Florida his whole life long. And he said, son, if that would have been sharp, you would have died for sure acting like that. <laughs> and he said, turn around and look. And I turned around and looked, and as the waves would come up, there was a whole bunch of dolphins. <laughs> 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 Oh, that one is shark. That was a dolphin. I only know that it scared the living bejesus out of this hoosier that had no business being that far out in the ocean. And had it been a shark, I would have never outswam that thing. You would have been without a pastor, and the story would have ended in a different way. I'm just telling you the same thing. If I were to be in the ocean and saw one of them great whales, I am not going to think this is a safe place for me. I'm going to try to get away from it. And I'm sure that Jonah didn't think that it was a safe place for him. And I'm sure that the men who threw Jonah overboard, I'm just going to preach my message. I'm sure that the men who, who threw Jonah overboard did not think this was a safe place for Jonah to be when all of a sudden they see this whale go and grab a hold of Jonah. I'm sure that every person on that boat said, poor old Jonah, he's done now. If he had any kind of chance of blowing back to shore, it's over with, because that thing just had supper. And it makes me understand and realize, oftentimes we pray and pray and pray, God, get me out of this trouble. God, get me out of this mess. God, I'm scared. But could it be that God has put a vehicle of grace in your life that your thinking is trouble, that your thinking is judgment, that your thinking is doom, when really it's just the grace of God that is carrying you through the tempest and is going to spew you out on dry land right to the place where God intended you to be to begin with. That's a challenging message, isn't it? It makes you wonder, where is he coming up with that at? Well, I'm kind of glad you asked. <laughs> he 
Because in Jonah we do find this place that we can go and be safe. In Jonah we do see in the scripture God's call upon our lives. His purpose for you. And I'm going to ask you again. What do you believe God has called you to do? What is there in your life that you feel that God has given you the, the perfect talent, the perfect ability, the perfect open door of opportunity to do something for him that gives him honor and glory? But you're saying no. You're saying this ain't for me. You're saying I can't do this. You're saying I don't want to do this. Do you know Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh? And the reason he did not want to go to Nineveh is because he didn't want to preach that message to the Ninevites. Because the Ninevites were Assyrians. And the Assyrians were enemies against I'm going to try not to get real theological here. I know some of you are thinking, you know, finally he's going to dig deep. But I, I'm not going to dig real deep. But i got to, I got to come around some issues to get you to understand something. The Ninevites were Assyrians. And the Assyrians were enemies of the Hebrews. Anything about God, they couldn't stand it. They were evil, wicked, sinful people. And in Jonah's heart and in Jonah's mind, he thought they don't deserve God's grace. And if I go over and I preach this message to the Ninevites, I know God. He's a God of his word. And if they repent, he's going to forgive them. And if he forgives them, he won't destroy them. And I want them destroyed. How many of you have ever looked upon someone and said, ain't no way in the world that person's ever going to get saved? How many of you have ever, have ever thought, man, if that guy goes to heaven, I don't even want to be there? I knew it would get quiet when I said that. You know, we live in a sinful, fallen world. We watch the news. We listen to the radio. We read our papers. We see all kinds of wickedness. You can't trust anybody anymore because every time somebody opens up their mouth, it ain't nothing but a bunch of lies, and we're tired of it. Oh, I can get real political here. I'm going to try not to. We, we read on the news of another innocent child that got hurt. Just having fun playing in a playground, but the wickedness in the neighborhood. Taking its toll on that little child. I'm trying to be a little careful. We've got a little. Bit. We, 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 we see all this injustice. We get on our computer. Have you ever. Man, when I get on the computer anymore, I know exactly where I'm going and exactly what I want to see because if you type in the wrong word, you're going to see more than you want to see. And I'm tired of it. I'm tired of all of the pornography. I'm tired of all of the murder. And I'm tired of all of the killing. I'm tired of all of the injustices. I'm just, have you ever just gotten tired of it? Have you ever felt like, I wish I could find out who these evil, wicked people are that are putting that stuff out on YouTube because my grandchild could pull that up and see it if I could get you in my hand. That's what Jonah was thinking. I don't want, Jonah is saying, I don't want to go to Nineveh. I don't want to see those people. I don't want to preach a message in Nineveh. They're evil. They're mean. They're wicked. They ain't never going to get saved. They're just going to take what I got to give them and laugh and mock and scorn, they're not going to receive it. And here's the thing, I know God, if they do receive it and repent, mm -hmm. and God's going to keep his word, and he's going to forgive their sin, and he's not going to destroy them, they're going to think I'm lying. <laughs> and you don't, you don't know. Folks, never, ever, ever, never let a bitter seed take root in your heart and your life. Yeah, preacher, but you don't know what they did. I don't know what they did to you, but I know what they did to the Hebrews, and I know what Jonah was struggling with. And I don't know what they 
they've done or said to you, but I know what they've done and said about me. And if you let a bitter seed take root inside your heart and inside your life, you're only going, you're only going to have a miserable road to home. It's so much easier for us to just obey God and do what God has called us to do, which is to be loving, kind-hearted, forgiving people in a society that knows nothing at all about being loving and kind-hearted and forgiving. Yeah, but I'm tired of being walked on. Yeah, so am I. Jesus was tired the day he got slapped and spit on and his beard ripped out of his face and nails dripping. Today's message is a message of truth. I knew it wouldn't shut the house down, but it's a good meal for you. God called Jonah to preach. What's he calling you to do? God called Jonah to preach, and Jonah said, No. What's he calling you to do? Are you saying yes to the call of God in your life? Well, that's different for me, preacher. You don't, you don't understand. I, can't, I think I can do okay with them little kids, but I don't want to do that. I think I can do okay with this, but I don't want to do that. I think I can do okay as a teacher, but I don't want to do that. I think I can do okay as a singer, but I don't want to do that. I love you enough today to tell you there's a storm coming. There's a storm coming. And you've gotten so comfortable saying no that you're asleep down in the hull of the ship. But the scripture says, make no mistake, your sin shall show you out. It's time for you to wake up. Yeah. It's time for you to rise up. It's time for you to yeah. come to understand that God has called you for a reason. And that reason is you're the only person that can do what God is calling you to do. I'll leave that to the other singers. It's not the other singer's place to sing your song. I'll leave that to the other preachers. It's not the other preacher's place to preach your message. I'll leave that to the other dads. I'm too busy. It's not the other dad's place to raise your children. I'll leave that to the other moms. It's not the other mom's place to be you. You have to be who God called you to be. And you've got to do what God has called you to do. And you can be like Jonah and say, no, I'm going to pay my fare if that's what I've got to do. But I'd rather be over here in Tarshish doing my thing because this is where I'm most comfortable. You've got a storm coming. You have got a storm coming. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to love you. I'm trying to teach you. I'm trying to admonish you and let you know that the word of God and the book of Jonah is just as true as the word of God and the book of Matthew. We can't just say that's the Old Testament and it doesn't apply to us because the Old Testament absolutely applies to us. Amen. Amen. It's about our choices. And when we make a conscience decision to do the wrong thing, you got a storm coming. I'm thankful today, though, because even in the midst of the storm, there's grace, mercy, forgiveness, and redemption. Mm. We see God's grace. I'm going to back up a minute. Not only do we find that place that we can go and be saved, not only in the verses of Scripture I've read to you do we see God's call, His purpose for our lives, not only do we see God's judgment, which we've already discovered as the storm, but we also see God's promise. In chapter 2, verse number 4, it says... Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. Jonah couldn't have been farther away from God than what he was in this. In our minds, Jonah couldn't have been farther away from God than what he is at this moment. He is in a whale's belly at the bottom of the sea. In our minds, there is no further distance between Jonah and God at this 
said, I will go with you all the way. Even in a whale's belly, even at the bottom of the ocean, you are not out of the promise of God. Then he said, I'm cast out of thy sight. Yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters come past me about even to the soul. The depths closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her fires was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord of my my soul fainted within me, and I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. Brother Chuck, read those two verses of scripture, and read it loud so everyone can hear you. This is 1 Kings 8, 37 and 38. If there be in the land famine, there be pestilence, blasphemy, mildew, locusts, or if there be caterpillar. If their enemy besiege them in the land of their cities, whatsoever plague, will stop, 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 stop. Whatsoever plague, keep going. Whatsoever sickness, whatsoever sickness, there be. What prayer and supplication soever be made by any man. Stop. What prayer and supplication so ever be made by any man? <laughs> Go ahead. Or by all the people of Israel, which shall know every man the plague of his own heart, and spread forth his hands toward this house. Verse 39, Then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and forgive, and do, and give every man according to his ways, whose heart knoweth, whose heart thou knowest, for thou, even thou, knowest the hearts of all the children of men. If that's not a promise that you can wrap your heart around, then I don't know what is. Yeah. If any man have any trouble, and lift up his voice, and cry out to me, God said, I will hear him from heaven. Jonah in the belly of a whale in the bottom of the ocean remembered God and turned himself toward the temple. I'm going to preach for a minute. I want you to picture yourself in this whale's belly in the bottom of an ocean with seaweed wrapped around your head. Total darkness, totally disoriented. You got thrown overboard from a ship, probably head first. Your feet and your legs wailing around in the water. A whale comes and swallows you up and goes down into the lowest parts of the ocean. And you, there's no way, no way Jonah could have had any kind of orientation as to where he was. If he was pointing north, south, east, or west, he could not have known physically which way the temple was. Have you ever heard somebody say, you're so lost you don't know up from down? This had to have been a picture of Jonah. And when God showed me this, it just flooded my soul that sometimes when we are in the midst of our storms, because of our disobedience to God. And when God's grace comes along and covers us up, it leaves us so disoriented that we don't know where we're at. We don't know where we're going. We don't know what we're doing. We don't know where this is going to take us or how it's going to turn out. In a sense, we're so lost at times in life that we don't know the difference between up and down. And how in the world are we ever going to find our bearings? Is there a compass that you can put on your watch from a whale's belly that's going to tell you, okay, you're looking north, but you need to... No. And sometimes life sits and leave us so disoriented that we don't, we don't know. 
how many times have I preached to you when you don't know what to do, do what you know to do? It don't matter if you're headed north, south, east, or west. It don't matter if you're standing on your head or if you're standing on your feet. Your heart is always facing the temple. And from your heart, you can cry out like Jonah did and say, God, I've got a promise that no matter what condition I'm in or what state I might be in, that I can open up my heart to you and cry out and know that you'll hear my prayer. There may be seaweed wrapped around your head and stomach acid from a whale that's threatening to eat you alive. But from that belly, Jonah cried out and God heard his prayer. And no matter what you may be facing, no matter what you may be going through, no matter what your struggle, no matter what your hurt, no matter what your problem or your trouble might be, you think you're so lost right now that you don't know the difference between up and down. But let me tell you something. You have a connection with the temple of God because if you're in Christ and Christ is in you, you have the Holy Ghost living and dwelling on the inside of you. And if you have the Holy Ghost living in the inside of you, you have a connection with heaven that you don't even realize you have. Praise His holy name. I'm getting excited. What you need to do is not allow the whale to swallow you alive, but to trust that the whale is not here as a judgment. It's not here to destroy you. It's God's grace. And it's getting you to where you need to go. And when you get there, the mouth is going to open and God's going to say, step out. I forgive you, son. I forgive you, daughter. Now go do what I called you to do. Oh, when you receive that victory in your life, then you'll be able to sit back and say, praise God. Praise God for the whales. I don't know that I'll ever want to swim with a dolphin again. I'm not going to way too scary. But I've learned how to praise God, not just in our good times, but in our bad times. I've learned how to praise God, not just in the sunshine as we do, but also in a cold day. I've learned how to praise God when I've had the money to make the payment. I've learned how to praise Him when I, I don't know where it's coming from. I've learned how to praise God when I felt good. I've learned how to praise God when I feel sick. I've learned how to praise God when we're getting along with everybody. And I've learned how to praise God when everybody just wants to kick me out. Mm -hmm. I've learned, no matter what state we are in, we can trust God. Mm -hmm. We can stand in His grace. We can receive His mercy. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. I feel like I've preached my message today, folks, but I want to ask you this question. I'm not going to say, is God calling you to something? Because I already know that he is. I am going to ask, why is God calling you to? And what are you saying no to God for? I love you today to tell you. If Jonah, think about this. If Jonah would have just said yes and went to Nineveh, it would have been so much easier on him. Yeah, preacher, but we wouldn't have that great story for you to preach today. <laughs> don't be the don't be the martyr here, folks. <laughs> Just say yes. I get you're uncomfortable. I get it pulls you out of your comfort zone. I get you scared. I get I, I get all of that. I fought it too. I still fight. But I've learned that obedience is better than sacrifice. And how much easier would it be to just say yes to God and stop saying no to Him? Let's rise to our feet and bring this up. Let's bow our heads this morning. Let's close our eyes. I wonder. Today in the congregation, the people, or maybe through Facebook or YouTube, is there one or more of you here today that you're hearing the call of God to come to salvation? And you keep saying, No, not yet. I'll come when I'm ready. How many times have you said that? Preacher, when I'm ready, I'll come. I promise. When I'm ready, I'm not ready right now. Friend, you are never going to be ready to turn your life over to Jesus Christ. There's always going to be another reason why you shouldn't. 
folks. It's so as hell. And I remember preaching another old-fashioned message where even the demons that was casted out of that man begged Jesus, please don't send us back to where we came. Friend, if hell is so bad that a demon doesn't want to be there, you need to really consider your life in Jesus Christ. Because hell is just as real as heaven. And heaven is sweet. And hell is hot. And judgment is real. And it's coming. And if you're outside of Jesus Christ, you can be as good a person as you can try to be. But by trying to work out your own salvation, and rejecting the blood of Jesus Christ, you insult God and you close the door of mercy and salvation and forgiveness. Would you come to Jesus Christ? Would you receive him as your Lord and your Savior? Would you stop saying no to the Holy Spirit as he draws you to a place of repentance where you too can be saved? Would you just open your heart and say, Father God, I believe that Jesus Christ is your son. I believe that he came into this world to fulfill your word. I believe that he died on an old rugged cross to save the world of sin. I believe he resurrected on the third day to open up a door of grace and eternal life. I believe he's coming back one day to judge the world of sin. Forgive me of mine. Save me. And make me your own. I come believing. I come repenting. Forgive me, Lord. And save my soul. Don't let me go another day in my sins. In Jesus' name. Maybe you're here today. Praise God for all who said that prayer. Maybe you're here today and you are in Jesus. Life has been so hard and you struggle so much with bitterness. You struggle so much with unforgiveness. You struggle because you know God is calling you to do something. But you don't want to do it. You struggle because you know there's things that you could be doing that's going to give God honor and glory, but it's not for me. I'm Oh, friend today, you know, you know, you know, if this message applies to your heart, would you admit that this is me struggling preacher? Every head's bowed, every eye's closed, no one can see you. Will you admit this is me preacher, I'm struggling with this? I need your prayers, I need your support. I know what God's given me. I know what he's given me to do. But I'm afraid. I'm, I'm scared. I, I don't know. I can't do it. You're listening to the voice of the stranger, friends. Start listening to the voice of God. And just do it. And you'll see you'll be blessed for it. Remember me, preacher. This is me. Father God, I come before you in the name of Jesus Christ and I thank you. Lord, for this day, and I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for the old-fashioned classic messages that are found written in the scripture. I thank you, Lord, for the picture of grace that you show us in your word. I thank you, Lord, because you are a God of mercy and a God of grace, a God of deliverance, a God of healing, a God of abundance, but Lord, you're also a God of discipline and a God of judgment, and oftentimes that discipline and judgment falls upon us. And it only falls upon us because we walk in disobedience. So today, Father, I pray that you'd forgive our disobedience. And Lord, I pray that you would allow us to see that these problems that we have in our lives, these things that threaten us and make us feel like they're going to overtake us, Lord, help us to see them for what they are, the actual vehicles of grace that you're using to take us from point A to point B. Lord, I know that there's people hearing my voice today. They have a call in their life. And they're not answering the call that you have given to them. So I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just allow this message to stay even after we 
dismissed from this little place. Holy Spirit, let this message follow them home. Let it follow them to work. Let it follow them to sleep. When they close their eyes, let them dream of this message. When they wake up in the morning, let them hear this message. Call out to them, Holy Spirit. Show them what it is that you'd have them to do in order to give you honor and glory. Bless our homes today, Lord. Let them be strong and founded upon the truth. Bless our marriages today. Let them be strong and founded in love. Let every husband that's in here be determined to be the best husband he can be. Let every wife that's in here be determined to be the best wife that she can be. Help us to raise up our children. Help us to raise up our grandchildren in the way that they should go. And stand on a promise you made. And when they're old, they won't depart from it. Help us to be forgiving of those that hurt us. Help us, Lord, that there be no bitter seed that gets planted in our hearts. Let us be the light that so shines among men that they see our good works but glorify you in heaven. Father, let this message come alive inside our hearts. Father, I love these people, each and every one. And I know that you do too, so I'll ask you once again, Lord, to please keep them all safe from harm's way. Bring us back at our next appointed time where once again we can worship you in spirit and in truth. All honor, glory, worship, and praise we'll give to thee. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.